Okay, so this is the Monday, February 27th, 2023 uh, meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. Welcome, everybody. And um, just to remind folks, if they don't already know, that the meeting is um, being recorded. Um, it is remote and it is be re being recorded. And we always begin these meetings um, with public comment. If there are individuals attending the meeting who are not members who have comments they'd like to make on any item that is not already on the agenda, um, we'd be happy to um, hear from you. And if you um, do, please identify your um, name and your address. And it looks like um, Jacqueline is first on the list. Jacqueline? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jacqueline McCraner. Um, I'm a Northampton resident, Ward 3, since 1977. And I guess what I have to say sort of touches on what will be coming up later on um, for agenda item number seven with the uh, preservation plan update. But just kind of in general, um, I'm hoping that folks received the email from a Florence resident, um, Jackie Balance, earlier today. And if you haven't gotten a chance to watch the presentation to uh, maybe view that at some point down the road. Um, I think that Northampton residents uh, have real reason to be concerned about uh, historic preservation at the neighborhood level. And it will be very interesting to hear what the Barrett Planning Group um, comes uh, to brings to the table in terms of recommendations for that. But I think our zoning and our planning really heavily favors uh, private developers at this point to the detriment of um, our neighborhoods. And um, I'm really hoping that Northampton residents can work with historical commission members and members of the um, planning department and city council and the mayor to, to kind of shift that balance. And what I think is also really important, I mean, I think that um, historic preservation is sort of putting being put on the back burner for neighborhoods with our current zoning and planning um, objectives but and goals. But I also see our, our um, sustainability and climate goals sort of being put on the back burner as well. And I think that that's uh, very concerning. I know that there's concern for um, a housing crisis and that uh, the UMass Donahue group put together a report uh, for the greater Springfield area and that in Hampshire County alone, there is, you know, within the next couple of years gonna be a shortage of housing units by uh, the number 3,572. So 3,572 housing unit shortage in Hampshire County. Northampton has about 18% of the population of uh, Hampshire County. So if you're gonna take 18% of that 3,572 uh, housing unit shortage, our, our percentage of that shakes out to about 640, 645, 650, um, units. And they're not saying that our population is changing, but they're saying that as people get older, um, they need smaller apartments and things of that nature to live in. And that that's why we're having this um, housing shortage kind of starting now and, and coming up. So um, there's a lot of push for development um, to create this housing supply that is needed. Um, but I think that what we could all be doing better is balancing that um, with historic preservation and um, with climate and sustainability goals so that we're not just blindly, you know, infilling our, our beautiful city um, where people really appreciate the open spaces between their homes and their gardens and their trees. Um, so that we're not just filling everything in blindly without taking into consideration some other really important things. And, and so the one other thing that I wanna mention is 
Uh, the other day, I attended a really beautiful Zoom presentation by local legend and old, old growth forest expert, Bob Leverett. And he said that um, we simply cannot plant our way out of the climate crisis. Um, we've got trees uh, that are our saviors, which are between the ages of 35 to 200 years old. And um, they are the ones that sequester carbon and produce oxygen. And without those trees, um, we're really not, in, not gonna be doing too good. And so uh, I would like to see the city be doing a better job of protecting healthy, mature trees because this is really crucial to our well-being and the future of our planet um, in, in Northampton. Uh, our ability to respond effectively to intensifying climate crises and whatever is, is coming at us down the road. So I'm really hoping that um, we can look at our zoning, look at our planning and think about how, yes, historic preservation is crucial. Um, you know, development is crucial and I, I, I am not for, you know, grinding things to a halt, but I think that we need to, to be planning things much more um, carefully and with a, a longer vision, um, I think we're we're a little short sighted at the moment. So those are my thoughts, and um, thank you for having me here and letting me speak. And thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Claudia. Hi. Thanks. Um, I'm backing up a little bit on what Jackie said, but um, you know my concerns, of course, are somewhat like Jackie's. And what's stimulated me, what's made me come to the meeting today had to do with agriculture. So I was very moved by this article in the Gazette some week, maybe a couple of weeks ago about Deerfield, how they've uh, got a grant to look at the role of soil, you know, in, in climate, what the, how soil contributes to uh, to conserve it, I don't know exactly what it absorbs, you know, it helps with the, with, with the air and so forth. And, you know, thinking I live in Ward 3, I'm on the edge of the uh, Montview Meadows. There's a lot of dirt out there. There's also a lot of dirt in my, my neighborhood. And as Jackie said, a lot of this dirt and soil is getting paved over. So it was that article, and then the recent conversation about having the uh, energy czar, you know, the conservation czar added to the planning department, that I wonder, you know, I wonder who is now, how are decisions going to be made? Like, I'm afraid the new uh, energy office is another layer of bureaucracy. So we have, you know, the historic commission that's looking at historic preservation, and we have very, we have the agriculture, commission that's looking at agriculture and I don't know how it all fits together to make sense to me so I'm trying to kind of preserve soil in the neighborhood and open space in the neighborhood it's a historic preservation question it's also for me a question about agriculture and what is the role in the future and now we're going to have this environmental office you know so some of so it seems like it all should fit together but it's what i guess i'm throwing out to you is this this question of how how is how does it all fit together and how does the historic commission rank in terms of all this how does anybody rank because ultimately city council and the mayor are making policies and so forth so um, anyway, it, I'm not making maybe too much sense, but I'm just saying that part of this is also about the Barrett study. Have they con gone to, in terms of history, have they talked to the farmers? When I went to the ag meeting, they didn't seem to know that this had been going on or that this was being considered. H how does agriculture fit into this pre historic preservation and conservation? That's my statement, thanks. Thanks, Claudia. Comment. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. We um, we have quite a few things on the agenda tonight, and I'm trying to um, tie this up by seven because Sarah's got to get home, and she lives north of here, and I'm concerned about her getting stranded in the snow. Um, but I, so I'm not going to give a very uh, detailed chair's report. I'm actually going to ask Barbara. I hate to put you on the spot to just give a little update on the tree at the park um, up at Village Hill. 
And you're muted, Barbara. You're muted. Sorry. Um, you think after this is almost three years, we would know to do that. Um, Everybody does well, it. Uh, in in uh, Village Hill, um, where I often walk, because I live right next to it, um, I noticed that one of the huge beech trees is down, just totally down, uprooted. And um, I saw a neighbor there and the person said it had happened Friday morning. So I don't know whether the ice storm was, you know, having ice on it and wind was a factor, um, but it just fell, it's totally uprooted. It's, you know, it hasn't, um, uh, Tom Riddell sent me a, um, actually a link to a video, which Sarah tells me was somebody's camera, you know, um, or a doorbell camera that actually recorded it falling. And it just, you know, it took like three seconds or something, it seemed. It fell very quickly. And Martha, you've, whoops. Um, and Martha, you told me that, um, you had emailed me that beaches are, oh, and there's a picture of it downed. Yeah, I had one also of my husband standing next to it just to show you how huge that root ball is. But it's now down. So now we're down to two trees because there were four probably 150 year old trees there. And Martha, you've said that beaches do have shallow roots and that they are now prone to a disease. So um, I don't know what's you know going to be done to try and protect the other two trees or if they're just doomed. I, I hope the city or whoever it is will just leave them because if they fall, they're not going to fall on anything. They're nowhere near, they're not near enough to a house, even if they fall the other direction. But it's very sad because again, now there are only uh, two of them uh, left. Yeah, they actually that's, um, my, Joe is on the left there. <laughs> uh, and there's the end of the tree because it's, it's quite large. Yeah, so, so this is a, you know, I'll just weigh in on the, the um, tree part of this and because it's related partly to what Claudia was talking about. Um, right. As everybody knows, we're uh, losing a lot of our um, native species. This is actually not a native species, but our, our old trees that we have counted on for um, so many, you know, so many generations is just being there are just really, um, they're really threatened. And I think Sarah and I were talking about this earlier. I'm hoping that um, when this tree is removed, that it can be replaced. But the replacements have to be trees that now will essentially survive, um, you know, the heat that we're having. And one of the arborists that I work with um, will tell you that in 50 years, we won't have any sugar maples left in New England. And the trees that need to be brought in to replace are trees that essentially grow in coastal environments now. So things like sweet gum and uh, red maple and so forth. So I'm hoping that, you know, Rich Parasoletti, who's our tree warden, who's excellent, um, will take that into account. And I'm hoping he can replace that with something. But thank you, Barbara, for filling us in on that and Sarah for showing us the photos. Okay, uh, we have one set of minutes that was um, reflective of our meeting on September 26th of last year. And, um, and there were only three of us present, uh, you, Barbara, me, uh, myself, and Dylan. Um, do I have uh, a motion? They, um, yeah, they, they looked okay to me. I, I meant to just um, email Sarah. There was one time when the word commission was spelled wrong. So maybe you can just do a find and replace for that. I, I, I apologize for not remembering where that was. You'll fix that, sorry about that. Yeah, and otherwise I, I would move to uh, uh, accept the minutes, to approve the minutes. And a second? Second. Okay, John. any discussion? Okay, we need to vote. All right, so roll call since we're remote. Dylan? Yes. Harvey? I wasn't there, but they look good. So I guess yes. So I vote, even though I was not there. You're allowed to vote. Yeah. Steve? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Barbara? Yes. All right, unanimous. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, the next item is um, the request for support for a Community Preservation Act application from the Historic Northampton Collections Preservation effort and i believe we have kelsey here um from historic northampton the collections manager who's going to give us a little overview of what you're proposing and um and it looks like betty's here as well 
And I just have to say, I was thrilled to see um, Lynn, um, Lynn's name on this application because she's just wonderful. But anyway, that said. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're excited to have her part of it. Um, I'm gonna just share a, a PowerPoint with this. Can I do that? Uh, yeah, you should be able to now. Okay. All right. Can you see that? All right. So um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Kelsey Sinelnikoff. I'm the collections manager at Historic Northampton. And we are applying for CPA funding for a preservation assessment of our clothing, textiles, and furniture collections. These are three of our three of our largest collections and um, are most historically significant in many ways. Um, they make up about 7,000 objects in the collections. Um, the vast majority were made or used in Northampton and are important pieces in documenting Northampton's diverse history. And uh, this project's part of um, our ongoing work to preserve and make accessible all of the estimated 40,000 items um, in our collections. Um, I thought I'd just start with talking a little bit about some of our more recent projects that led up to this larger project that we're um, applying for funding for. Um, these are photos from some of those um, that we've undertaken to better preserve, track, and provide access to the collections. Um, and many were um, thanks to support from the Historic Commission and funding from the CPC. Um, so we're very grateful for that. Um, some of them, I just put a few examples of the recent projects, including um, renovated storage and uh, reno our renovated storage and collections processing area in the Damon basement, which we did in 2017. And that's in the top right corner there. You can see the then and now. Um, in 2021, we renovated our archive storage room and um, inventoried the archives. And then just a few weeks ago, um, we were able to install new shelving in two rooms on the second floor of Parsons, thanks to a small CPA grant. Um, and we're currently inventorying um, the objects as they go back into those into that room. And then we've done a number of other collections rehousing projects. So I put a couple examples down there, like our Historic Arms collection, Pro Brush, EJ Gare. And beyond these physical improvements in recent years, we've also done some projects that have set us up well um, for this upcoming assessment, including installation of a new collections management database um, in 2021 that allows us to better track the our collections records and locations and increases our ability to share these with the public. Um, and we've also done a number, um, several small preservation assessments within our collections, like with the Shepherd Barn collections. Um, we recently worked with our audiovisual collections, um, baskets, several others um, that I think have given us some nice experience in how to plan for a larger uh, preservation assessment and the resource understanding of the resources, people, time, and supplies that we're going to need. Um, so that gets me to um, sort of a I give you a little overview of the project um, for this project um, with the help of a of consultant um, museum specialists, um, a project assistant, along with interns and volunteers and staff. We plan to um, examine and document each object in these collections. So we will look individually at them, assess. Um, then record things like condition, location, provenance, measurements, dates. Uh, we will address conservation concerns, improve individual collections um, item housing. So that would be things like as we go through them, we're going to be removing dust or dirt off of items. So doing some cleaning, um, improving like their support and their housing. Um, so like adding acid free tissue, making sure they're in archival boxes making sure there's things like foam between stacked furniture. Uh, we'll also note any hazards that we come across with the objects um, and consult with conservationists as needed um, and take some steps like if there's something has mold, isolating that or addressing any pest infestations or that sort of thing that might um, we might see. Um, and then we will also be updating records, images, and creating digital records. I think a great byproduct of the project will 
B, that it will enable us to know, um, to have these updated digital records and enable us to know exactly what we have, where it is, and share that with the public. Um, and that's important for a number of reasons from public access and interpretation planning to security, disaster planning, um, and even just minimizing kind of wear and tear of items. So we're not just like searching and having to move things all the time to try to find them, um, but we'll know exactly where they are to physically access them. Finally, the consultants um, that will be working with us will create overall assessment reports and recommendations for each collection. So that'll be things like recommending long-term um, preservation plans, um, assessing, doing some curatorial assessment, looking at the strengths, the gaps in the collections, some ideas for interpretation um, as well. So what we'll actually be looking at with the assessment will be, um, as I mentioned, clothing and accessories. That's um, our first one. That one, that collection we estimate to be around 5,000 objects. The um, items in it date from the 18th up to basically the present, the 21st century, and includes all sorts of clothing, um, along with like hats, dresses, shirts, pants, um, various accessories. This collection is probably our most well-known and recognized um, throughout New England and even beyond. Researchers travel to Historic Northampton to see the collection. Pieces have been featured in publications and in many exhibitions. And it's um, just for a couple of highlights, it's particularly strong in late 19th century women's dresses. Uh, many of these were locally made um, when there was a there was a thriving dress making industry at that time, um, employing many women and girls up to around 100 at that time. And the collection in general has some wonderful um, breadth and document and paper documentation. Um, so really gives us some connections to many different people, groups, and organizations that have called uh, Northampton home um, throughout its history. And I show have a few pictures here of different pieces in the collections. We have hundreds of children's clothing, um, which is a wonderful highlight. Um, just to give you an idea, some of the local significance, um, here's some examples. We have um, bodice here made from silk grown and spun in Northampton, um, connected with the beginnings of the silk industry in Florence. Stockings made from McCallum, so another business and industry. We have pieces from Northampton State Hospital, like these patients' shoes, um, and even some more modern shirts, um, like this t-shirt from um, a Pride Celebration. We'll also be looking at our household textiles collection, which we estimate to be about a thousand objects. And um, mostly those date from around the 18th to the 20th through the 20th century, um, include things like uh, quilts, sheets, um, blankets, napkins, window coverings, um, various other household um, textiles. And like the clothing collection, these items were primarily locally made and have strong Northampton connections. Um, many of the quilts have been featured in publications, and um, we also have some wonderful examples of um, locally woven like linen napkins and other household textiles. Um, and working with us on both these uh, collections will be Lynn Bassett. Uh, we're really excited to have her work with us. Um, she has over 40 years of experience working with cost costume and textile collections, mostly in the Connecticut River Valley and including several years in the early 1990s at Historic Northampton, and she's come back and worked with us a number of times since then. Um, so she's got a great depth of knowledge, clothing and textiles in general, but also of our collection. Um, and I think that will be invaluable with this project. So she'll be able to really look at the pieces efficiently, um, go through them with this project, make sure they're well cared for. Um, she will work closely with the project assistant training them and um, reviewing their work um, with it. And finally, the third collection will be the furniture. Um, the furnishings are number about a thousand objects. And that would include things like chairs, tables, desks, bookcases, stools, lighting devices, clocks, um, like the other collections. Many were made in Northampton and are used by local families and businesses. Um, it's particularly strong in late 18th and early 19th century chairs. Um, this was a 
period when the city was a growing commercial center and um, we had a large number of furniture and cabinet makers. And so we have some wonderful examples of some of the pieces made um, during that time, which are great. Um, some other highlights include a Florence sewing machine, um, locally made clocks, um, furniture from Northampton State Hospital, among others. And for this um, collection, we um, plan to bring on museum specialist, Richard Malley. Um, he has also several decades of experience working with uh, furniture collections um, in New England museums. Um, he will um, carefully assess um, likely each of the pieces. Um, we'll work with the project assistant to make sure we are um, addressing each of them. And I think his expertise will also be invaluable in helping us both meet our goals and move efficiently uh, through the project. Outcomes. Um, so for this project, this project we uh, will result in better intellectual control, public access, and security of the collections. And specifically, it will improve collections preservation and documentation. Um, documentation and rehousing is essential to preserving the collections. Um, we will be able to identify conservation concerns, make sure knowledge of the objects and their history is not lost, it's preserved for future use. Um, we'll record this important information um, and its care information, as well as, as I mentioned, take those steps um, with the individual um, rehousing as needed. Um, it will, the project will also increase collection security and disaster planning. Um, a current list of what we have and where it is is essential to good collections care and long-term preservation. Uh, it will improve, it will have enhanced um, the public access to the collections. Um, through this, there'll be updated records and images that will improve public and staff access um, through an accurate and searchable database. And um, current location reporting will allow objects to easily be physically accessed um, for use by researchers and in programs and ex exhibits and other um, for interpretation. And then um, finally, um, it will facilitate long-term collections care, planning, and interpretation. Ass assessing everything in the collections will allow us to better understand what we have and how to care for it. Um, this information serves as a foundation for exhibits, for programs, and research, and allows us to make sure we're serving the community and caring for its history um, to the highest standards. So um, to reach these goals, um, it is essential uh, that we bring on the people with the expertise, the skills, the time um, to work with the thousands of objects um, in these collections. Um, with the funding, we'll be able to hire um, the consultants with the collection's knowledge required and a project assistant who will allow us to efficiently move through the project. Um, we will also use the funding to consult with conservators as issues with objects are identified and carry out the recommended steps for stabilization. And finally, we need supplies to make those basic improvements um, to that collection's housing and their support. So, in conclusion, um, we hope you'll consider um, supporting this project and recommend it um, for the funding. Um, and we really appreciate your support and I'd be happy to answer any questions or go into any more detail. So thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. That was an excellent presentation. Um, and it's wonderful to see all of these objects that were produced right here um, over the centuries. Um, so I would open this up to any questions that the commissioners have at this time for Kelsey or Betty. I, I do have a question, uh, this is Barbara. Um, what, what's the timeline for, for this project? What's... Yeah, um, we are projecting that it'll take a little over, uh, probably around two years. Um, mm -hmm. So we'd wanna start it in the summer. Mm -hmm. Basically, and, as soon as we got the and, funding, and and what's the budget for it, and what are you asking for from mm -hmm. the from the CPA? We're um, asking for one hundred twenty eight thousand, mm -hmm. and it is um, for bringing on those consultants and for hiring a project assistant um, mm -hmm. to do a lot of that day to day tasks, as well as um, supplies and some money for the conservation work. Right. And the budget itself is much larger, and um, right. a great portion of it is coming from historic Northampton, like Kelsey's salary and all, all the rest right. of that. Right. 
And, and just to emphasize that this is one of probably 10 steps that we're taking to assess our collection. And this is kind of right in the middle for both, for all those large collections that really need mm -hmm. outside expertise. Kelsey and her team have done a lot already. Right. We'll continue. Uh, others, Steve, Harvey, Dylan, questions for Kelsey or Betty? Um, I just have one question, but I think this is probably going to get asked at the CPA meeting. I'm the representative of the commission on that committee. So, um, but I, I'm, the others here might be interested too. I think one thing that um, the, commi the committee will probably want to know is, um, you know, what the larger public benefit is about this. You know, do you have plans for specific exhibitions or bringing the public in? You know, kind of the way that you did with your barn raising and the work on the barn, you really got the public involved in it. And they're always looking for, you know, ways to broaden the support um, to outside the institution itself. What are your thoughts about that? Go yeah. ahead, Kelsey, then I'll jump in. Yeah, I think that um, there'll be public involvement in a few ways, um, and it'll definitely improve public access um, to these objects overall. Um, we have a robust volunteer group, um, so we'll definitely beyond the um, people that would be hiring for this. We would also have volunteers, student interns working with this. Um, we also, as I said, it'll improve our records and we have that database. So it's now makes it publicly accessible. Um, so that's a great way it's attached to our website. So people then can see all these objects because we have a lot of paper documentation, but we don't actually have them digitized. Um, so this will be a great step with that and adding thousands of records to that public will be able to search. Um, and we're definitely always open um, for people to make research appointments if they want to view something in the collections as well. Um, they can do that. And I, I would cool. add a, a very long-term goal, which is that, you know, this collect, especially the costume collection is, is just amazing. We don't have a place to exhibit it yet. And, and we don't have an exhibit of it. And we have a couple of things. We have quite a few things on exhibit right now, but we would like to do more. And I think it's really important that we really assess the collection, you know, basically do your research before you, you do your exhibit. And that'll help us in the long term. I, I don't. I can't say in the next year or two that'll happen. And you know, we can't bring everybody in like we did for the barn raising. But we we definitely want to think about that in the future. And the other piece to it um, that Kelsey alluded to is that if we want to think about collecting the here and now, and we want to collect all of Northampton history and all of Northampton represent all the populations of Northampton, then we really need to step back and assess what we have and the space we have and the space requirements we need to keep bringing on things. Otherwise, you know, you'll know, you have a collection that's stuck in 1890 and, and that's just not right. So we've, we've got to continue to get intellectual control so we can move forward on that. Great. Um, I have a lot of other questions, but I'm gonna save them for the CPA meeting, CPC meeting. Um, so we do not need to vote, am I correct, Barbara? I'm sorry, Sarah, we do not need to vote on um, approving or not approving this, our, our so, approval. Yeah, so I realized um, when this application came in that the Historical Commission has never formally determined the collections at Historic Northampton to be significant to the, to the city's history. Uh, and, and that's a requirement of eligibility for CPA funding of something that isn't uh -huh. listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So although the grounds are, the collections themselves are not, so that vote would be necessary. Well, I would move that we vote to recognize the, all of the collections at Historic Northampton as, um, as you said, significant or historically significant for the city. Yeah, okay. I would second that. I, I think these collections particularly are really world-class collections and should be recognized sure. as such. Okay, any discussion? All right, I think then we're ready to vote. All right, so a, a roll call on that. Greg? I have a vote in favor. Dylan? Yes. Harvey? Yes. 
Steve? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Martha? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. So we'll take that to the CPC meeting, which is Wednesday night, just to let them know. Thank you, Kelsey and Betty. It really sounds great. Thank, Thank you all you. very much. Very Thank exciting. you for your support. You know, I'm not on the board anymore, so I don't get to hear about these things, you know, early, but boy, this is a really exciting project and, you know, you've got the right people doing it. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Heard Thank you. Saying. Great. All right. So we're a little bit off schedule, but it's okay. We've got a public hearing now, and this is um, to determine whether 67 Park Street, which is map ID 23A-031, should be determined preferably preserved pursuant to the Northampton Demolition Review Ordinance, Chapter 161 of the General Code. Um, and uh, I don't mean to sound like a broken record because we've had a number of these applications in front of us in the last meetings, um, but essentially what we need to do is to um, look at the criteria uh, under which we would make this determination. And if it's something that we determine um, is something that should be preserved, then we um, have the option of putting a delay on the demolition. Um, so I just want to review with you, there are nine uh, criteria that we look at, and these are listed on Sarah's staff report. If you have that in front of you, I'll just run through them quickly. So everyone at the meeting uh, who's not a commission member understands. Um, okay, first of all, what is the current condition of the building? How intact is the building? What is the age of the building? Is the building or structure an exemplary representation of a certain style or period? And if so, how many of those exist? What is the building or structure's role in the streetscape? Are there exemplary construction elements that embody distinctive characteristics of a period? Does the building or structure yield information important to history? Has the building or structure been designed by a famous or locally known architect? And has the building or structure been removed from its original, original location? If so, does it still have architectural value or is the surviving structure importantly associated with a historic person or event? So the nine. Um, so I, um, everybody has seen the application. You've probably seen the photographs that were hopefully on the website of the city and possibly gone by to look at it. It's right across from the Park Street Cemetery. Um, so I would open this up to um, any questions or discussions. I believe the applicant is here. Uh, yes, Max Hubert. Um, do commissioners have questions for Mr. Hubert? Uh, perhaps the subcommittee that reviewed this um, might have some thoughts about what was discussed or what your thoughts were? Well, not discuss. We just you know, sent in uh, our finding separately to mm -hmm. Sarah. But um, I felt that even though uh, the part of the building that had been part of the, uh, what is the North, um, sorry, I'm looking here, part of a school, the North Schoolhouse in Florence, it was moved there. To, to its present location. I know there've been additions, um, but I still feel like it's a significant um, building in terms of the history of Florence because it's probably the last remnant of that earlier schoolhouse. Um, it seemed to be in reasonably good condition. I know there were, there were some issues as I walked around it. It is on a huge lot. So I guess I understand the temptation to fill that lot, but, um, and, uh, Something else that I made a note here. Um, and I also felt that it was just, even with the additions, it's, it's very interesting architecturally. I know the chimney's been moved, but I still feel like enough of the um, original uh, um, look of the building and particularly the history of what it was is there. And um, I know we're not supposed to consider what might happen, but I think the application said that uh, there was a proposal for a number of townhouses, six or seven townhouses in this space. And I'm at least hopeful that if 
that project does go forward, maybe there's some way to include this as part of that, to renovate this. So this is the look on the street, which would still really um, uh, help retain the character of that street. Um, and then whatever addition might be, whatever additional buildings would be behind it and not as visible from the public way. Um, that's, you know, that's sort of the best case that I would hope for, you know, no demolition using this as one or more of the units. And um, that, that would be my, my hope for it, as I said. Okay. Also, I, I wanted to just mention, I think you all know this, but um, this, this is, um, is in the area of the uh, district that is being considered for a right, national sure. register. And um, this property is, um, was determined to be a contributing resource to that district. Now the district has not yet been approved by the park service, but it's underway. It's quite underway actually. It's I think right. under review at Mass Historical yes. right now. So I thank you for mentioning that, Sarah. I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Martha, that's okay. We're all <laughs> name mixed up tonight. Steve or Harvey? Or Greg, do you have comments about this? I, or Dylan? Maybe a little bit arcane, but the um, related to your last comment, Martha, the draft preservation plan chapter three in one place refers to um, a multiple property nomination that's underway and in other places refers to it as a district. Um, those mean quite different things to me from my experience in the field. Do you know if it is indeed a district? And if so, are the boundaries generally around Florence Center? Or is it, in fact, multiple properties that are associated with a theme, for instance, abolitionism or connection to Sojourner Truth as a significant historic figure or something like that? Sarah, do you want to explain that? Because uh, it so it's, it's been sort of a work in progress, but it, it is around the theme of abolitionism generally um and i don't is the abolition reform yeah. yeah i mean i think that there's a there's a core district in the yeah. um, vicinity of the house and park street and the cemetery and all the um, buildings associated with that and the northampton um community um and then there's also a broader multiple resource um nomination going on that includes other um, buildings, properties associated with that um, abolition and reform movement that aren't necessarily in Florence, because I think some of them are closer to town. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, not... I, I know there was a, a larger work in progress with a an abolitionist district that included um, things downtown and even things outside of Northampton, but that was sort of running on a parallel track, track from this Florence district that does have a defined boundary and contributing and non-contributing resources. Correct. That's very I'm not right. Yeah, thank it's you. Just arrived, so I have to go. But I'll say I was I was on the subcommittee, and it did seem to me this house did have an obvious historical value. That was my my sense. I'm sorry, I have to leave. Bye bye. Thanks, Harvey. Thank you, Dylan. Do you have any comments about it as the historian or Greg, who lives in Florence and grew up in um, Florence? Maybe you don't live there. You grew up in Florence. I know that. Well, I, I think the, the Form B is a little confusing about the history of it, but I think it's, it's clear that it has many connections to either the first or the second schoolhouse in Florence, which and that at least parts of it were originally on the corner of North Main and Bridge Road, then were moved to about the site of the War Memorial across the street, then was moved again to the what was the Florence Methodist Church and now is the BFW, and then was moved back into the current lot. Um, but even with those three possible moves, it's still been at the site it is since 1873, which alone makes it, you know, definitely within the realm of the types of things we, we generally deem preferably preserved. Um, so I think it's incredibly historic. And, you know, some of the, if we choose to put in a demolition delay, some of it might just be to learn more about, about what exactly remains of the original building and, you know, to do some more research about its significance. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Dylan. Um, Greg, do you have any comments? 
Hey, uh, good afternoon. Yes, I, I did grow up in the area. I do believe that Park Street is a uh, part of a, a significant part of Florence uh, downtown area. I did go around the house. It is a dilapidated structure, but I do believe it is savable. And I would vote to delay on the middle demolition. Okay. Um, any other thoughts? Steve, do you have an, any other thoughts other than questions? I No, I would just say, I, I think that of these you know, criteria, and as I understand from our previous discussions, it just has to meet one, one of the criteria in the ordinance, but it seems to clearly meet both the age, you know, this is constructed before 1900, the form B has it as circa 1860, and we hear from Dylan's research, it's been in the same um, location since the 1870s. And then the other, I think, is that it's um, it it may yield information important to history in this ongoing effort and its um, status as a potential contributor um, suggests that um, a demolition delay is warranted. Okay, great. Um, if there are no other comments, I, I would um, entertain a motion to um, either delay uh, if well first we have to uh, decide whether we um, think this should be properly preserved and then if so um, would secondly be putting the delay on it and, and, and Martha, you might want to ask for public comment also if there is any more. oh sure does anybody have any comments that are not members of the commission okay Sorry, am I, am I allowed as the applicant, am I allowed to make a couple of comments? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you very much, you know, everybody for, for taking time out of uh, your schedules to, to do this. Um, I appreciate it. I just want to preface by saying that I am, I consider myself a history guy. I've, I've told that to Sarah many times. Um, so, you know, I, I have a soft spot for buildings like this. It, it might be hard to, to imagine that, um, you know, when you just get a, a blank um, application for demolition. But um, I just want to touch on a, on a couple of quick things. The first thing that uh, Barbara mentioned was if there was a way to sort of, you know, make sort of meet all of our goals in uh, in one project by getting some infill, some tasteful infill that, you know, the, the neighborhood and everybody can be proud of, but then also preserve um, the, the most important pieces of the, the parcel as it relates to the streetscape and um, saving, you know, as much as we possibly can. So that's sort of where I've been going since I, I got the, um, you know, I got, I, I had a, a feeling like we might be headed in this direction. And so I've, I've started to look at other options and making one of the units, especially the unit in the front, that existing structure, or at least part of, I think is, is a, a happy medium. Um, and I'd be, I'd be happy to explore that. So I just wanted to, you know, put that out there and, and um, sort of second that. Okay, thanks, Max. I mean, we're not supposed to consider that in our um, review, <laughs> but you no, know, it's like, what do you have to say? Discount the evidence of the, um, that's being presented, but sure. um, yeah, I think that's certainly, and I know there are models for that in other um, cities and towns in the state where you have a particularly historic building and um, the land gets developed around it and it preserves the character of the streetscape, which is really important. And then also because it's becoming part of this National Register District, uh, and I'm sure it will be a district um, when it's eventually approved, um, that's pretty important, so. Um, okay. Can I, I, can I can I say one other thing? Even yes. though, as I said, I had even said in my original comments, we're not supposed to consider what might be going in place of this. But I think for us to declare it significant and impose a delay would be um, useful. And what what can happen if, if because the, the delay is to allow the owner or the developer to consider mm -hmm. other things that might happen, and it just means you know. I know I don't, you know, because we, you, from what you said, it doesn't sound like you're going to tear it down and then think about what you're going to do. But it, it just protects the building from something like that happening. Somebody thinking, oh, I'm not going to use it and just tearing it down and then 
figuring out how, what, how, what they're gonna put there. And this way, if the, um, a, a delay can be lifted by the historical commission at any point, if the applicant comes back and we approve of the, the plans for the building or, you know, I mean, it could be that you say, oh, we can't possibly be reused and we're just gonna document it and salvage what we can. We might, you know, we've agreed to things like that in the past, but um, it, it just allows time and makes it official that we don't want this building torn down until more consideration has been given to saving it. Sure, that makes sense. And um, I appreciate that. I appreciate the clarity. And I, and I will also just add, I, I know that, um, like you said, uh, Martha, this is probably not supposed to be considered, but the, I have had my architect and my structural engineer come through there. A building that's in this condition, there's a ton of rot. It would really have to be reconstructed from the inside out anyhow. Um, so, you know, if, if we were to do that, it, it would take... Um, well, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but it, it would take quite a bit. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there is something, there's certainly stuff worth saving um, parts of the structure. So I, like I said before, I'd be happy to, to you know, entertain a, a few different options there. Good. Okay, great. Any other questions or comments? Okay, then um, we need to first, um, there needs to first be a motion to address the preferably, preferably preserved. I will make a motion. I would second. Okay. Any discussion? So Sarah, we need to vote on that. Or do you wanna do one vote for both? Uh, up to you, either way. Well, okay, so why don't we do one vote? And so then there would be another motion um, regarding the uh, delay period. All right, so I would draw my motion or just uh, have you word it the way that we should make it. Um, Greg, you're, happy, you're welcome to um, word it for us. <laughs> I, I don't know if I have the experience. I think that would be best Give it a for shot. you, Martha. Um, <laughs> 70 foot law from half court. Yeah. I would just make it a simple thing as I I, uh, I make a motion what Martha says. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. That's my easy way out of it. No, no, so, Greg, the, the commission could impose a, a, a demolition delay of up to 12 months. Right. Okay. So that would be the motion would be the period that we would um, we would want to impose. Of up to 12 months. Okay. So I make that motion. Okay. I would second that as well. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. We need to vote. All right. So roll call. Craig? Aye. Dylan? Yes. Harvey? Oh, Harvey's gone. Steve? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Barbara? Yes. All right, unanimous. Great. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is an update on the historic preservation plan element of the comp plan. And I believe, Steve, you have been enlisted to provide an update because you've been the most, you've been present at the most recent discussions about this um, where Barbara and I could not be. So are you happy to do that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Try to keep it brief so we can have some discussion. Um, Sarah and I both attended a presentation by three representatives from the consultant team. And there were um, five items that we discussed. One was a review of outreach to date, uh, including, and this was in a PowerPoint presentation. So some of the dates of visits to farmers markets, um, discussion, or at least a uh, listing of uh, stakeholder outreach, comment walls, um, community to community, uh, for a one uh, virtual and one in person. The second item was to announce that the survey that the firm sent out has been, the resident, resident survey uh, has been completed and uh, we received a copy of that. The commissioners received that on, on Friday. So 
This is two days after the meeting, and then it's also on the web page now. I went and checked and saw it there. So for any members of the public, if you're interested in those survey results, uh, it includes some bar graphs and data and, um, and, and all of the responses to the open-ended questions, so all of the text responses. So there's a lot of information there. Um, the consultants highlighted how many respondents, uh, what a high percentage of the respondents had lived in the community for um, more than 16 years. Uh, uh, more than 70 percent, or exactly, in fact, exactly 70 percent of respondents had lived in the community for 16 years or longer. Um, the third item was to share with us, there's a revised chapter three. Uh, commissioners also received this recently, uh, and it is also on the website. And that one significant new part of that is an analysis of the inventory, uh, which is the background information for planning and decision-making purposes that's collected um, about historic resources in the city, potential historic resources. So today, for instance, you may have heard us talking about Form B. Um, that's the standardized form that's used for this kind of information. So, um, so that's an addition as well as some changes to that, that report. And fourth was a uh, discussion of upcoming analysis or work in progress which includes the consultants looking at uh, legal questions as well as best practices in the field as they relate to things like ordinances or other parts of preservation planning. And um, that, that work is underway. And it sounds like maybe March, mid to late March, something like that, we may be receiving um, some uh, written documents from them and, and that that part of the plan would include some recommendations. Um, so they're really bringing their expertise at working in other communities, but also thinking about things like um, how the state, the laws of the state, laws of the Commonwealth, in this case, MGL 40 C, uh, structure what local commissions can do and that sort of framework, regulatory framework for um, preservation planning. Um, and then the last part of the meeting was really a more open-ended discussion about um, things that we might do next. And one idea uh, that came up was possibly um, because there's a lot of interest in planning issues um, and where preservation and planning interface is a possible joint meeting um, with the planning commission or some way for historic commission members to have some conversation with um, planning commission members about um, what's happening there. Um, and then there was quite a bit of discussion about um, the need for more uh, uh, educational resources, um, maybe links on the web page, activities that the commission could sponsor or carry out themselves um, to explain how preservation works, what it does, what it doesn't do, um, what um, kinds of um, laws are in play what how the structure of preservation um, is organized and how it works. Uh, so it was a wide ranging um, kind of update. And uh, we have two new, to just sum up, we have kind of two new documents in front of us, a revised chapter three and the survey results uh, with more coming in a, in a month or so. And I'm happy to answer any questions about um, any of those other things. I've also had a chance to look through that revised Section three, I started to go through the survey, so I'm happy to <laughs> uh, talk about either one of those documents a little bit too. And before we get into questions, I'll just add that um, the, uh, a joint meeting of the planning board and the historical commission seemed like a, a good way to have a broader discussion about mm -hmm. this, uh, both as an opportunity for the historical commission and the planning board to get together, which doesn't happen all that often, and because the planning board um, is the entity responsible for actually approving the preservation plan since it, it is a component of Northampton's master plan, which is sustainable Northampton. Uh, so probably late April, early May would be the meeting for that one. Yeah, and I think on a related note, one of the things that struck me was that from the consultant's perspective, doing these plans for you know municipalities across the Commonwealth, that there is a... Um, legal, regulatory, administrative 
framework in which they're um, created and uh, and that there are these uh, processes by which they are reviewed and approved. Um, and that's neither here nor there. It just sort of it just sort of is. But they were they were concerned about consistency. And I think this comes from the state office of historic preservation in part, um, but consistency with other plans and um, the uh, the way the information is presented. So um, that was that was an interesting thing for me to learn. Well, it also seems as though getting back to what Sarah was, well, both of what both of you were saying about um, you know the interface with the planning board. I would imagine just from all that I've read um, on the survey and also in their section three, that there will be recommendations that are very much um, something the planning board will need to you know, consider. It's not something that necessarily just sticks with the historical commission. I, you know, I'm imagining, I mean, we don't know yet, but um, it seems that a number right. of these have been raised yeah. are really ones that are, you know, um, that affect the existing zoning ordinances and and long term planning issues. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the historical commission was the the real driver of the preservation plan because historic preservation is your charge, and that it's an incredibly important topic that really wasn't being addressed to its full extent within sustainable Northampton. But the recommendations are by no means being made solely to the historical commission. You know, it's to the city and it's the city council and it's planning board and others as a whole. Which is really the way it should be done. I mean, it's it makes it much more relevant and effective and important, honestly. So we can only do so much. Yeah, so. I think, you know, one of the questions that came from the consultant was, do contemporary or do current development proposals, you know, get forwarded to the commission as a as just sort of a matter of courtesy of, or intergovernmental communication, right? So like, um, not that we would necessarily weigh in on uh, many of them, but just sort of here's what's happening in real estate development, in investment in the city. Um, and so that, and I think that came from working in other communities and kind of seeing how that happens in other mm -hmm. places. So I see that as going two ways, right? So like improved communication would allow the planning commission to say, hey, look, we're noticing there's a lot of this going on. Just wanted to let you know. Whereas we might say, oh, we're noticing a lot of this going on, just want to let you know, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that, you know, preservation has the legal structure for preservation. There's a certain set of tools that are at, at our disposal that come under that banner and, and that it fit that legal definition of preservation. But then there's other things that the planning commission can take up or the planning commission can do. Um, mm -hmm. And as I said, some of those are spelled out in in state law. And unless you're a city that has its own charter, a separate city charter, then you fall under the general guidelines for all Massachusetts municipalities. So um, so that kind of thing I thought was really interesting. Like, you know, sort of like how does the what's the flow chart and what's the flow of information between different commissions within the city? And I think we often see that with CPA, you know, with with those like we heard tonight. Um, and that um that that's one that's um we're connected with now, but but maybe better connection with planning would be something else. Mm -hmm. And as a start, you know, even just um, having a joint meeting to kind of talk talk through some of the issues. Yeah, definitely. You know, one one thing that struck me in looking at this material because I got I got a chance to, you know, read through that the revisions to the and the additions to the chapter three, but I also did, pretty, you know, really looked through, didn't read every word of the um, their compilation of that um, survey. And what struck me was, I mean, this is a lot, you know, they compiled all this, listed all the comments, all the little graphs and charts. There were, what was it, 150 people responded to this survey. So I'm not saying that it's not important to hear from 150 people, but I feel like, um, you know, from, from some of them, how, um, with how long they'd lived here and other things, it, it's kind of a self-selected group too. So. I wonder if there was any discussion about how to reach more people and how to get them to care about this, you know, particularly enough to comment on it. Um, you know, as I said, it's 150 people out of 30,000 people. So, and I'm not discounting it, but yeah, so, I just wonder um, and Sarah, you know, how, how Sarah, much we're like, gonna get and how useful it is. Yeah, so, um, 
I guess first a personal comment, then what the consultant said about the survey, and then the more general question and more community input. Um, I, I, what we received is raw, it's raw data. There's no interpretation. Um, and they described, I think in the um, consultant's proposal and in some follow-up communication that they um, use this as a matter of practice and other planning projects and other places and that they work with a firm or an, or an app or a service. So I think what we have in our hands is just the, the algorithm that, that collected the database information and spit it back out. Um, at that point, I didn't, we didn't have a cop. I didn't have a copy. Um, the commissioners didn't have a copy, so I didn't know what was in it. Um, other than the one figure that they mentioned about kind of length of tenure. Um, so I think the question of how to interpret it is an open one right now. And no, no one has talked about that yet. It's right now. It's just raw. It's just raw data. Mm -hmm. Um, the other part of it of sort of what comes next in terms of more input and more conversation, um, there was a conversation about a next public forum. So there will be, um, that, but I think that's happening after, their next deliverable with the recommendations. Is that right, Sarah? So the, there's there won't be a, another broader public input session, but there will be you know many opportunities once the plan is complete to discuss its recommendations and ways the city can use those to move forward. Okay. Um, and so are, is that something like a presentation at a historical commission meeting, or what is it that's in the consultants? contract for that next meeting. I can't remember. I've, actually, I have it in front of me. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, I don't know. Um, deliverables in phase three, right? So we're, we're through phase two and we're starting phase three. Yeah, it says present recommendations at public forum. This is on page eight of the... Yes. So there's a, it sounds like a presentation with a, with the opportunity for public comment. Yeah, but so that will be the, the joint that, meeting of the Historic Commission and, and Planning Board. One of the other things that came up uh, was um, what the commission can do on its own. And I think uh, my, my view is that we should make this a regular um, agenda item going forward with some time to discuss what's happening, especially if we're going to be keep receiving new new information and that they um, are still looking for feedback on um, the draft materials. So um, I, that was another thing I thought was pretty interesting was that they, um, they encouraged us to be the place where that could happen so that there would be um, more opportunities for discussion. And I think that's good. I think we, I think we can and should do that as part of our agendas. Steve, did you get a sense that um, they're intending to set any priorities as far as recommendations are concerned? Meaning like what's most important to take on first? Um, I think that our RFP and their contract or their, I guess I should say proposal, their proposal response um, uh, includes some uh, things that, that sound like that to me, that we should be looking for that. And if we don't get it, I think we should we should ask for it. So, you know, a ten, like one of the work items here under phase three recommendations is a 10-year preservation action plan. Yeah. Well, an action plan where everything is the same priority doesn't seem very useful. Um, you want to, it needs to be phased by year or by urgency or by uh, funding availability or mm -hmm. you know, other other priorities. So, um, yeah, I mean, I know so, yeah. Usually... So I think an action plan should have some some way of prioritizing, and maybe it's a mix of all three of those things, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly not envisioning like a, a numbered list. Do this first, and then, but at least high no. and, and low. Right, low, and usually priority, they do, priority, yeah, priority, yeah priority. like a one to three yeah. year, three yeah. to five year, um, and then five, you know, five to ten years. That's usually how, yeah, planning. That's how it's done. Yeah. So we have I mean, a sense of, of what are most urgent. One of the other things I really appreciated about the conversation, again, they're bringing their expertise in other communities. And I tried to push them a little bit and say, well, you know, what are other communities of our size and our sort of, you know, character that's, you know, not not in the Boston Metro, but like around 30,000 that has similar 
you know, resources and that, and that sort of thing. So I think they're thinking about what some of those might be. Um, but they, uh, they, they brought up that it's somewhat unusual for a local historic district design review commission to be folded in together with the whole historic commission. Uh, which I think, what was it, 2013 is that happened here or 2011, something like that. Um, so they are noticing some of the ways in which Northampton is different and um, and and sort of ask the question, well, is that is that is that useful or or not? Would it be better to have a committee that's more focused issue. on that and then have the historical commission deal with other issues? You know, they came together. Could you split them? You know, so um, so I think they're thinking about some of those mechanisms and. And obviously the architectural review commission for downtown, right? Is that's another mm -hmm. really unique feature of right. Northampton's preservation planning. Um, and I have just learned recently in reading the drafts of the report how that's been significantly revised through form-based zoning. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of technical, I mean, I sort of consider myself an insider to this, and there's still a lot of technical stuff that's like challenging to master. So I think that's really what they can do for us is. Um, bring back those questions and observations and say, you know, this is different from other communities. Maybe it's working for you and that's great. Or maybe you want to think about, you know, making a change or adopting a new ordinance or you know, something like that. So those are the kinds of things I'll be looking for in the next, next report and in those recommendations. That's great. Thank you for that summary. Um, so does, let me just does, highlight one other thing. There are some, one of the things that we talked about was that some aspects of the plan will be highly technical. Um, and that's important because there's multiple audiences, right? Or multiple publics. Um, so they want to include those. So like, for instance, about the inventory. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone has looked at it yet, there's some stuff in there about preservation restrictions, which is really highly legalistic and interesting, which raises a bunch of questions for me for the future. Um, yeah. But then there's other parts of it which are really oriented towards just general information for the community about this is what preservation is, a sort of place where you can go to find out about stuff. So um, that that need to to talk to multiple audiences to to reach multiple publics, I think, is another characteristic of the plan that we should be we should be thinking about. Um, you know, actually, on that note, Steve, I just, you, I'm glad you brought that up because I do have a question, um, which I could raise outside this meeting, but Sarah, I noticed that there's a preservation restriction on the Bridge Street, Bridge Street Cemetery, and I'm assuming that's because um, of the gravestone conservation. Yeah, so the, the city Does, applied for, hold that? Uh, yeah, the city applied for and received a Massachusetts okay. Preservation Projects Fund grant for right. gravestone restoration and as a requirement of that. Um, sort of in a, in a complicated way that the uh, Massachusetts Historical Commission holds a preservation restriction on the cemetery. And so that grant that they provided did not cover stone restoration or conservation at Park Street or West Farms. Is that my memory of it? Correct. Those, that was entirely CPA funded. So the okay. MPPF grant only went towards Bridge, Bridge Street. Right. Okay. So why did the CPA not and I should know this, why did they not uh, impose a preservation restriction on those two sites if they were funding work there? They just didn't really feel that it was Necessary. incredibly important. I mean, it, it's a strict re requirement of the MPPF yeah. grant right. funding. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't really an, another entity available to hold it. Um, Mass Historic uh, is often not really as willing to hold a restriction on um, on elements that aren't listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which those two aren't yet. And also Please because there, there's more um, maintenance and management concerns there. And the, the city also had some questions about what that would mean going forward and whether that would complicate that work. I got it, okay, that's a sign. Um, do, do, Dylan, do you have any questions or Greg? And if not, I'll um, open it up to anyone from the public. It looks like Claudia, you might have a question for Steve. <clears throat> yeah, I have a, a sort of a comment in that what I've read, do you hear me? All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's yeah. the, best, the best plans in terms of a city is when the public is actually involved in the planning process and not just reactive. So a plan is presented and you'd say, well, we like this part or we don't like that part. And the outreach has been so limited, not just in the survey, but even attendance at these, these meetings, the two that they've had, that, that we're not, 
then we're not starting out with the best possible beginning. We're not having enough public input. So I'm just putting that out to you to say, you know, somehow that should be grappled with, you know, so that we actually get the best possible plan. So thank you. So thanks. Well, thank you. Jackie? Yes. Um, oh, gosh. I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. Um, I know I had a question on, um, I think it was very clear what Steve was describing in terms of um, the survey results that came back, that raw data. But then there was an article three thing that I was wondering if, if you could just like explain that a little bit more um, that they had revised or updated, uh, if I have that right, if it was article three. And then um, the last thing is, with the um, the meeting between your commission, the historical commission, and the planning board, that that probably wouldn't be public, right? That would just be um, between the two. Yeah. And I mean, it has to be public. It's a public. I mean, there yeah. Was... My understanding is that would be a public meeting, and there it would be, be public, public comment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So and so the community would have a chance to see planning commissioners and historic commissioners in in dialogue. Yeah. Sounds lovely. Um, okay, yeah, um, Steve, do you know what I'm talking about with the Article Three or, or? Yeah, so they it's sort of like a chapter. Um, so they're using the word section, but basically, you know, the plan um, from the um, initial proposal, and then um, as it's developed since then, they said these are going to be the chapters of the plan. And for whatever reason, instead of calling them chapters, they're calling them sections. And so section three is called investigation and analysis. And that, that chapter of the plan sort of comes in the middle. I think there's maybe five total or six total, something like that. Uh, it's, it's 31 pages of single space material. <laughs> so, you know, the, the whole thing when it comes together, let's just roughly say it, it could be, you know, a hundred and something pages. Um, so there's a lot of information in there and there's a lot that they wanna be sure and and record and um, do their due diligence in, um, in analyzing that. And I think in that way, it's 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 valuable both for the public and for the commission because we're, as commissioners, we're learning a lot about sort of the state of preservation in the city. Um, just like that last question, right? About what's happening with the cemetery and preservation restriction or I'm thinking about questions like, you know, did the historic district for the former Northampton State Hospital get delisted after demolition and what's the status of that? You know, so there's just a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of details. Um, so yeah, so within that, um, that chapter, they break it down and then each one of the chapters has little subheadings 3.1 through 3.5. But Steve, all of the and, and Sarah or whoever, all of the all of these drafts are available from the city's website from the historic the North yeah, so historic you just like, website. You type, so you anybody can look at them, those drafts. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And in fact, that would be great if if members of the public had um, you know, feedback on specific items or, or questions like that. Like, well, what is this preservation restriction or what is this? National Register District. You know, one of the things I'm thinking about, which I'll communicate to the consultants, is how um, most people don't talk in terms of resources and think of a district as the same kind of resource as an individual landmark or as an individual building. Um, and that it's helpful sometimes when you're talking about a district to know, well, how many properties are in that district? Are we talking about a district that has 150 different properties in it or one that has four, you know? Um, so there's some things like that that I think could help, you know, provide some additional education for the commission, for staff, for elected officials, and, and for the for the public, for Northampton residents. Because, for instance, like we're talking about downtown, so let's, I don't know what the number is. Let's say there's 70 properties. It's probably more than that, but whatever, 200 properties. Um, that's a lot of different owners. That's a lot of different interests. That's a lot of different buildings. It's a lot of different potential CPA applications. You know, one of the things that comes in the text comments is people saying, I'm a commercial building owner and I, did, I don't know where to go to get, you know, funds or if I want to mm -hmm. uh, try to uh, work on my property. So I think we could do um, 
we could do more to kind of make the information available. Um, you know, here's how you go to CPA. Here's how you go about a tax credit. Here's different things that you could you could do. Um, and thinking about um, you know how many different buildings and owners there are and how many different properties it it kind of brings something that's abstract like a district as a resource to life. Um, maps would also help too, I think, to be able to see. You know, mm -hmm. we have some of those. It just I don't think it's like asking to make anything new. It's just putting that into the plan. Um, so th those are the some things that I'm thinking about. Yeah, that, and there's no graphics in the plan yet. Th those definitely are coming. Right. Yeah. yeah, photographs too. I mean, really giving a sense of the story of the range of um, different historic resources and the um, and then and then what information we have and what information we don't have. You know, one of their big recommendations is. Um, here, here are parts of the city that that no one has ever looked at. There's no, there's no background information on for planning purposes. Right. Um, so you might make that a priority. Go and survey those areas. So, yeah, I mean, I thought that um, there were a lot of really great points made in the survey comments. I, I think people had some really great ideas, and I'm hoping that you know the consultants will take those into account. Um, yeah, I think so, those open-ended, whether whatever you think about the survey and the methodology, mm -hmm. um, that those open-ended comments really give you a peek into a lot mm -hmm. of it. There's a lot of disagreement. There's a lot of different perspectives. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of different ways to see, you know, uh, what's the most important issues or um, what should be done or, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was it was a real range. It was a real range. It was very, yeah. it was very interesting to look at. Yep, I think that's so true. And you know, some people um, are really concerned about losing the character of the city, and others just love it. You know, they just they think it's a great place. Don't change anything. You know, um, so it's really. Uh, it, I thought it was very instructive, even though it was only 155 people. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think that's. Uh, that seems like a big number. It was bigger than I expected. I thought you know, we might get something back that had 40 respondents or something. So I know. I mean, Steve, you and I both have been in this world. <laughs> it's really hard to get people to do this. And even and especially, you know, when you we were having live, there were very few live public gatherings over the last three years. Um, but the few that happened, you know, people just not comfortable going out for this kind of stuff. And so it was challenging. Some ways we got a lot more participation, but um, it's still, you know, it was still challenging. So I think yeah. Um, yeah. we should look on the bright side of things if we can. So. Yeah, yeah, and people have a lot of other, a lot of other commitments, and and a lot of people are involved yeah. in other commissions or other, you know, yeah. community groups or other, um, right. you know, community activities. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I, but I. But but I do think I'll I'll say it again. <laughs> I think we should meet in person if we can. So yeah. I'll, I'll 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 take that as an opening to propose that again. I think it's I think it's important for the public to be able to see us in person and to um, to have the commissioners there. Um, yeah, there's just something about being in, being in person that's very different for this deliberation, even if it's hybrid. You know, even if there's a, a mm -hmm an opportunity for virtual participation too. So yeah. I'd hope yeah. And I think um back to that. I know the same. last time I polled the commission, um, we had a couple of members who are not with us anymore who were not comfortable meeting in public at all just because of you know restrictions on their um situation. So uh, that may have shifted and maybe people are more comfortable getting together, which would be great. We also don't know what uh, the state will be doing with the extension mm -hmm. that allows fully remote meetings that may disappear completely in March and we may be forced to go back to fully uh, in person. Um, and we don't really have a word from the legislative delegation as to what may happen with them yeah. at this point. Well, as I said, it has encouraged a lot more involvement in some ways. Um, so that's been good just to be able to have the virtual, but. It's also a loss, I think, not being able to be together. So, 
I mean, some people, some, some, I've worked on projects in the last three years where I never met the people that I worked with for, you know, 18 months. I never met them in person. I wouldn't know them if I saw them on the street, which is, it's weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Any other thoughts while we close? It's almost seven and Sarah needs to get home before she gets stuck in a snowbank. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then I will, um, Entertain a motion to adjourn. I will make the motion to adjourn. <laughs> then second. Okay. Great. I guess we can all say yes or no. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, we'll see you in March. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. All right. Thank you. All right. Safe, Sarah.